At 12.36 in the wireless room of the Titanic, Operator Phillips received his first encouragement. She's 58 miles away, sir. And she says she's coming hard. 58 miles. They'll be too late. Still on board, Operator Phillips, Operator Bride, Captain Smith. And you have done your full duty. You can do no more. Abandon your cabin. It's every man for himself now. There's still a little power left, sir. So you look out for yourselves. I'm Ted Sinclair. Well, uh, it was a, a, a replica of the uh, Titanic's radio room. Um, which uh, I, I took an interest in a few years ago, and I decided that the the radio room was an iconic part of the story, and so I thought, well, that was within my capabilities to make, and uh, so this is this is the result of that uh, that desire to represent the the that important room. But the information required to build something like this is available online and, and so on. We do know what equipment the, the Titanic had, although we really only have one very bad photograph of the radio room that was taken, which obviously doesn't show everything that was in the room. So consequently, I, I added a few things which uh, um, I thought would probably be in the room and, and nobody knows they weren't. It just makes it look more, more lived in and, and so on. For, fortunately for us, um, there was a, a Jesuit priest on the ship who'd uh, decided to take a trip between um, uh, Southampton and, uh, and County Cork uh, just to experience riding on the Titanic and as a result of which he took many photographs on the ship which uh, he took ashore with him and uh, fortunately we now have the ability to look at them. Um, but the, the, the one of the radio room wasn't a huge success because he, he, he double exposed the photograph. So we're working with limited information, but we do know roughly the layout of the room. Uh, we also know what equipment it had because the Olympic had the same identical equipment. And uh, so this is a, a result of, of the studies that I've done for the past four years or so to make up these these components. There are a mixture of genuine components and and reproduction ones to make up the set. The most difficult thing for me to make, you know, in in a garage workshop are things like um, the the terminals, uh, null terminals, and so on, which were you know of which there were dozens on, in this room. So being able to collect those, and then I can then make up the rest of the components with whatever came to hand really, and uh, and brass where uh, it, it was needed, uh, and so forth. I've recently discovered that the room was actually a little bit smaller than shown here, so you can see the uh, confined conditions that the uh, the operator had to work in, um, and they, you know, they 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 did the double shifts, um, or, or the work alternate shifts to uh, to to create to maintain a 24-hour shift on on this particular boat anyway. And I suspect the films tend to use larger rooms because uh, they needed to get more than one actor into the room at a time, and uh, and uh, you know, so they needed a bit more room to do that, and uh, the. The film that most people are familiar with recently was the, the James Cameron film, and he based his radio room on the, the, the layout of the Olympic, um, which was fair enough. Um, but uh, there was far less stuff in this room on the Titanic, as mo many of the, much of the stuff was next door in the, in the generator room. And, uh, you know, so... Uh, but you can imagine if there were two men working in here at the same time, they would get in one another's way. So um, this is why you have one operator at a time. Um, and, uh, and, 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 you know, that's the way it worked. Have you ever sat at your desk and touched the Morse code and thought to yourself, would I have... Would I have stuck till the water was lapping my boots before I left? <laughs> Would I have been that faithful to my service? What what thoughts come across you? Well, I suppose really, like like everyone on the ship, they they would be. Um, 
doing their job until the last possible minute. Mo mo many of them knew that they probably wouldn't get off the ship, and I think probably the Marconi operators as, uh, as well as anybody. Um, and, you know, Phillips obviously stayed at his post, being the senior one of the two, uh, until it became necessary for him to, to get up and leave, you, mainly because the power uh, had disappeared anyway, and uh, so it was pointless in being there. Um, but uh, no, I must admit, when I had this room set up in, uh, in a museum recently... Um, Which museum is that? This was in Swaffham in Norfolk. I had the lamp on the one that's directly over the desk, and uh, only, and uh, so it was a, a quite a, a moody kind of a, a light in the room, and sat there in, in silence because the museum was closed, and uh, I just imagined how those men must have felt sitting, and they would be looking at more or less what we're looking at today, you know, with very, very little difference. And they would be looking death in the face. They would be, yes, exactly, yeah. At their age? Yeah, exactly. The, at, uh, I think um, Bride was, uh, was, was about 20, I think, and, and uh, um, no, yeah, Bride was 20, and, and uh, um, uh, What's the other operator's name? Phillips. Phillips, yes, Phillips. Uh, he, yeah, he was about, about 22. So, yes, they, they were quite young men. What do you hope will become of your wonderful display? Well, um, hopefully I would like it to go to a, in a permanent site where it could be all wired up properly and, and, and uh, uh, get the full treatment, as it were, and, um, uh, and then stay there until, you know, uh, it, it's no longer of interest. But, um, yeah. Is this your final labour of love? Is there anything you can add to here? Ultimately, what I'd like to do, you know, in a museum possibly dedicated to, or, or part of it that was dedicated to this, this um, Marconi suite, which was three rooms adjacent to one another, uh, would be to reproduce all three rooms so that people can look in and see where their, their sleeping quarters were, where the main generator room was and so on, and see it all in as a complete unit. Um, oh, that's what I would like to do ultimately. It's but good to hold that, that extra vision, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Complete. Tell me what the other rooms will consist of. Well, the, the generator room, which would be adjacent to this on that side, the door would be roundabout through there. Um, uh, that, that had the big uh, continuous spark generator, an enormous five kilowatt um, unit. Uh, and um, yes, that was, uh, that was in the room next door, which was double insulated for sound. And um, uh, it, would, um, uh, it would consist of dustbin sized generator, <laughs> Um, lying on its side, like a dustbin lying on its side. It would have batteries and things called jiggers, which were huge ma mahogany boxes with cables sticking out of them and, uh, and so forth. Um, there would be a, a couple of fire buckets, um, sand fire buckets, um, to uh, put out electrical fires with. There were, there were several, there was quite a lot of stuff in there. And on the other side, over my right shoulder, there would have been the, the door to the crew quarters where they, they, where they slept, uh, where there would be two bunks, one above the other. Uh, there was a sofa in there as well, and uh, a, a wash, you know, a, a fold away wash basin, uh, and, and perhaps a wardrobe. And that, that would also be part of the, 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 the suite. Well, here we have um, two batteries, which uh, supply the power for this, the latest uh, part of the set, which was a, a, a single valve receiver, which had a alternate valves that, in case one blew. And this was the, the little charging board for it. To, keep, to You know, that would be wired into the ordinary mains to, 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 to charge the batteries to, to operate the, uh, the receiver. Um, but it would also be used in conjunction with, the, with these two here, which um, they, they would get finer tuning from. The, ba the backup unit is the, the older um, uh, induction coil, um, spark coil, which uh, would operate on a much lower voltage. It would operate on uh, two small, uh, smaller batteries in the room next door. 
uh, and it would have a, a charging board on my right here which would charge the, the, the batteries. And this, this was the basic set, part of the basic set that would have been used on most ships, not just liners, but you know, even sm things as small as um, freighters and so on. Um, it, it had a fairly limited range, two or three hundred miles on, on, on normal day operation, whereas, and that would be operated by the um, the single Morse key here. There will be two of these keys side by side, and and that one would uh, operate the that unit there, and that was kept switched off most of the time. But the other Morse key, which would have been here, was the one that will be operated in conjunction as as a transmitter in conjunction with the, the big spark generator next door, which which was a massive thing. But the the the, the thing here, which is which is uh, the earliest detector that Mark Coney made, that, that was for, for general use, that was quite a breakthrough, and that was used in conjunction with the multiple tuner here uh, as, as part of the, the, the three units there. I have an interesting theory about the, the lamp that's hanging here. This is uh, one of the few authentic things in the room, and this is a silver-plated table lamp which could also be hung on the wall, which was uh, standard throughout the ship. I can only conclude because there were so many things that weren't finished when the Titanic sailed. They, they unlike the Olympic, which was already at sea and, and was fully kitted out, they had no overhead desk lamp. And I can imagine Bride or Phillips going to the stores and saying, we haven't had our desk lamp fitted yet. When are you going to fit it? And they probably said something like, we, well, we haven't got one, so you'll have to make do with, with one of these table lamps and uh, you know, do your best until we can get you a proper fitted unit. And because I can't think of any other reason why a first-class table lamp would be in the, hanging on the wall in the radio room. The, the brass pipes here, which are part of the, the Lamson um, system, which conveyed the messages backwards and forwards to the purser's office on the deck below, the, the, the canisters would be filled with, that would contain these, these messages here that would be folded up and put inside, and then they would be sent up uh, there, and they would finish up uh, downstairs. Um, and, uh, and then they would similarly send one uh, back up once they'd got a, an order to send a message which would fall out of here and, and land in the, the cage um, for, the, for the operators to pick up and unwrap and then transmit whatever message had been sent. They, 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 they were a, a vacuum system, quite a low, low pressure vacuum system, probably not much bigger, more, more powerful than, than the household vacuum cleaner. Um, they were made by a company called Reed. Uh, Reed & Co, who also made other instruments and so on. They later sold their vacuum system to a company called Lamson, who are now even now in existence, and they, they still make vacuum conveyance systems, which are used in hospitals and supermarkets and so on, for, for conveying money. The drawer handles are interesting because the, these, it took me four years <laughs> to find the right drawer handles and, and I'm, I'm using uh, photographs of the ship that were that were taken by various uh, companies uh, of both ships both the Olympic and the Titanic. I eventually found a pair on eBay which a lot of this stuff came from and it turned out they were made in the Midlands uh, by a, a company called, that might sound a bit familiar which was Cartland and Co. The chap who owned it that was the great uncle of Barbara Cartland the, the novelist and uh, and the, these these draw handles have got the name stamped on the back of them. Unfortunately, I only had two, so I had to send off and get copies made so that I had the full set for the draw. If you look at the, the quite good picture of the Olympic, you will see that it has these these type of draw handles, which are quite unusual in that they're fairly large. In actual fact, I've I've got a copy of the the catalogue that they were sold from, and they they're called lifts. I don't know why they're called lifts, unless you put them on the end of a box to, to lift them or a, or a trunk. But, uh, but it's common to call draw pulls lifts. They're, they're insulators, uh, standard insul big, uh, they, they're, they're mahogany insulators actually. They did them in ceramic and you'll probably be familiar with the, the, the large ceramic ones that you see, that you see around. The, uh, the, vacuum the vacuum system exhausted by the third pipe. You can see the, the two pipes, there's one going out 
and there's one coming in, and there's a third one, and that was where the, the, the vacuum exhausted into the room, which uh, probably helped a little bit with the ventilation. How genuine looking is that uh, Morse key? Well, this one, the, the Titanic. Well, the big one. There are many copies and many there Morse are. keys. Which one did the Titanic? Well, uh, well th this one here is the one that is shown in in the the, the photograph. There's this one photograph that we have as being in the Titanic, but also in the Olympic. And you'll see them side by side, the pair of them. And uh, in the photograph, you can make out the shiny tops of them and the, uh, the, the terminals as well. Have you um, learnt a bit of more since you took up this? Not really, no. no. Could you do us an SOS message on it? <laughs> well, it would... Dash, 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 dot, dot, dot. Yeah, it, we, we, that's what it would be, sort of... more or less like that, only much faster. In order to qualify, they had to uh, be able to transmit 40 words a minute, and that, which is not 40 characters a minute, 40 words a minute, uh, in order to qualify. And if you, if you see how long it took me to, <laughs> to transmit SOS, you can see how slow I am in comparison. Um, their, their, their hands would be operating like a blur. Um, my, my ship was sinking. How, how didn't they send the wrong message out, misspelled? It makes one wonder, doesn't it? Well, after the years that they've spent um, at the keyboard, and OK, so they, so they were quite young, but they'd still been at it for about 10 years, probably, because um, they, would, they would have gone into um, the post office school as, as youngsters. Um, they, 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 they rarely made mistakes, and... Uh, they also had a very clever system whereby they used to abbreviate words, like uh, old man, for instance, which everybody's familiar with. When they're, they're referring to, talking to somebody they know, they would refer to him as old man, um, how you going, old man, or whatever, uh, and that would be O-M uh, on, on their thing. They wouldn't spell out the whole word. So it was but, sort of a sh even a shorthand? There, there was a, a very distinct shorthand. I mean, some, some shorthanded letters could stand for an entire sentence, and uh, which would make uh, a good way of saving money because, uh, as, you, as, you, as you might not know, to, in order on a, for a passenger to send the, the average size message on a ship would probably cost them in the region of fi the equivalent of £50 pounds today, which is a ludicrous amount of money Consider we can just pick up a mobile phone and, <laughs> and just talk to people straight away. So, uh, yes, it was... Uh, it was when you look at the entire contents of this room and you consider that this can only do a tiny fraction of what our model modern mobile phone can do it just it's mind mind boggling really but he started it but he, but marconi started it really marconi like so many people in in different uh, areas of, of research and so on would, would had used the expertise of, of uh, an awful lot of other people who were working in the same field um, and uh, but Marconi was the one who was able to put it all together and turn it into a commercial enterprise and uh, so uh, and that was how he was able to to uh, build his factories and so on. And, well, he did build whatever you say about it. He was the first one to build it. Yes. Whoever invented it, whoever he stole off, as they claim. Yes. He was actually making the first interchangeable wireless sets for ships. Well, that's it. And, and uh, the army. Yeah, that's and right. The Navy in particular. It, it was the it was the the having the the. the um, money. For, the foresight and, and also the money he was able to get investment to do this work uh, to um, to put the whole thing together in packages and and uh, and sell it and uh, there are, it, it turned out there were other companies in other parts of the world um, the, the Americans had a system and and Europe had a system um, but uh, Marconi really had the the, the largest share and uh, so uh, he, he, he was one who made the most money at it. There were, there were lots of criticisms of him because he did 
rather cheekily patent some designs which were not his to patent, but uh, then uh, but you usually find that anybody who's who's going to get anywhere it, it has to be a bit ruthless, and uh, so uh, Mark is Mark only has to go into that category. I'm afraid. Apparently, but, he was very ruthless with people who pinched his ideas. Oh yes, I mean yes, he, he took them to the patent shop. Yeah, that's right, and he would. And um, but uh, it, it was quite interesting to see that he had a lot of his patents revoked in the 20s because he wasn't entitled to them, which I thought was a bit amusing. <laughs> Some people have asked me why there are two clocks. This, this, this uh, like many ships, um, they, they, were, they would be doing a regular run from one place, from one country to another. And what the, what the system had was that the, the port, the, the one clock ran at the port of departure and the other clock ran towards the, uh, arri the, the, the time at the arrival port. So by the time uh, this particular ship had got to America, one clock would be reading the right time and uh, the other clock would be reading the time in the UK. Which uh, is which up there? Um, it's usually, uh, I think it's usually left to right, but I'm, um, in other words, the left one would probably be the home port and the right one would be the destination. Have uh, you accurately copied the wooden frame, one being sort of threepenny bits and, and the other one circular? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I did do quite a lot of shopping and, and changing around faces and things to, uh, to get the, the exact size. I, uh, I discovered after quite a bit of research that the faces were actually both six inch faces. Uh, which uh, I didn't, didn't realise at first. I thought they were eight inch. Um, so, but now it's it's pretty much as it was. Uh, they were made. The 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 whole system on the uh, Titanic was um, was supplied by uh, uh, Magneta, who were a, a well known clock company that supplied clock systems for factories and, and so on and so forth, uh, and the post office and so on, uh, clocking in machines and so on. There were about forty odd clocks throughout the ship. Um, and they were automatically adjusted at midnight to until they, so they were perfectly right for the for the time uh, that the ship reached the next port. Uh, and they were they were an impulse clock, which a lot of people may or may not know is that they were operated from a master clock, um, which sent impulses to all the clocks on the ship, uh, so they all changed their time at the same time. Yeah, this this lifeboat is actually again. A reproduction of the of the ones that would have been scattered uh, over both ships. Actually, the the, the Titanic and the and this one that's actually marked up as the Carpathia. Uh, the font on it is actually copied from uh, a photograph of somebody who was holding one on the Carpathia. And the Carpathia was the rescue ship that rescued over 700 people when the when the Titanic went down. And the the chap here, this is Arthur Rostron, who was the the captain of the Carpathia. He, he, he was able to pick up the message, although he was about 50 miles away, uh, he was able to turn around. He was on his way to Gibraltar, actually, going in the opposite direction. But he, when, he heard, when he got the, the message, when his operator got the message, then they turned the whole ship round and headed back. But it took them a, a while to get there, by which time most people uh, had, uh, uh, were still surviving the lifeboats, but anybody else had died. Um, they probably would have been dead no matter how close they were really. Because of, uh, of, of the, the fact that Captain Rostron, who, who was uh, an experienced captain and really uh, on the ball, they were able to rescue with the help of his, his, his own radio operator to rescue 700 or more people and, and the, in being, operating with the, the two operators in this, in this radio room were able to uh, save, save the people on the, uh, on the Titanic, those that were saved.